Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Eleanor Warnock, I'm deputy editor at Sifted, and I am very excited to be here today with an incredible panel of all ladies. Yes. <laughs> to talk about yeah. networks and how networks can be used to help people who have not traditionally been excluded from networks, but how they can also be used, obviously, to exclude. All three of the women up here with me have staked their careers on creating networks to create a more equitable place in entrepreneurship and in business. And so I'd like to kind of start our conversation off by just digging into those networks that all three of you have created. Lindsay, do you want to kick us off and tell us a little bit about Chief? Sure. So I'm the co-founder of Chief. It's an executive network that we launched in 2019. And Chief has 20,000 executive women across the US and UK. We founded Chief because we found that executive women were often put in a place where, in addition to having to be an incredible leader, they also needed to be the de facto mentor. They had to be the de facto woman on stage representing other women. And so those women were often shut out of old boys clubs, closed networks of other executives, and they needed their own place where they could rely on each other, support one another. So they stayed in leadership and can pave the way for others. And so uh, right now we are really excited to uh, make sure that our women have the support community and education that they need to stay strong in those roles. Love that. Rachel, let's come to you next. Let's talk about what you've built. So, wow, wow. so it seems like a while ago, but it's pretty recent. Um, so back in 2020, I think we can all we all know there was a lot of uh, uprise around you know, diversity, George Floyd's death, all of that. And um, at the time, I was at Google, and we saw an opportunity to really help seed the ecosystem and try to assist with trying to make it more diverse from a startup perspective. I think, you know, I don't need to repeat the numbers, but they were abysmal in terms of the, number, the amount of funding that went into black founders. So at the time in 2020, I co-founded a black founders fund, which is now in its third year. We have some of our black founders out there as well, one in the front row right there. Um, and it, we just saw incredible results. Um, and we started it with the idea of, wow, if we could just seed some of these great startups that generally get not much funding, and if we could just get maybe a few unicorns or a few really progressed startups, we can prove to the ecosystem that a successful founder can actually look very different than the traditional white male. I also co-founded our Black Angels group because it's a two-sided problem, really. Um, there aren't any investors that look different. I mean, there are a few, but not really. And we all know that people tend to invest in people that look like them. So that's part of the problem as well. So we thought, well, what if we could seed some amazing angels? but from the earlier stages. So Googlers that are black, have disposable income, and can invest, even if it's a little 3,000, 2,000, small amounts of money, and see success with that money. And as they grow, then they'll have more money, and then they can invest more. So we really try to you know, address two sides of the coin, and those are the networks we built. And uh, I'm really pleased to see where we've come, we've got a ton of our Black Founders Fund recipients walking around here and engaging with the ecosystem, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy where it's ended. It. Uh, Suzanne, what about you? Tell me about what you're building, Backing Minds. <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, I'm the uh, founder of Backing Minds, and we uh, started 2016 uh, to invest outside of the homogenous networks. And what does that mean? Yeah, we have almost all capital um, it was the same uh, eight years ago, it's the same today, it, it was the same 20 and 30 years ago. So almost all capital remains in tight networks, which means that the majority of founders don't get capital, even though they have like, great ideas and initiatives. So basically, um, when I looked at the statistics, uh, there was an arbitrage on the market to invest in these great founders, uh, when they're not in the hype, the bubbles almost, it's almost always to uh, like a lower valuation. But then these companies get fuel, the capital, and grow. And uh, that's also a way to change the ecosystem. Because by investing in these founders, um, we invest in new types of owners. And they get a chance to also make exits and also become investors 
uh, in their way. So um, I have so many examples because we invest in many different areas. But um, um, yeah, so I can talk uh, later about like the specific cases that we invest in and how they build like ecosystems. Uh, like our first investment, it was three um, guys with Somali background, um, you know, from a no-go zone or whatever you would call it. Uh, they contacted more than 100 investors. They didn't get a meeting. When we saw this company, we saw nothing but potential. And Transfer for Galaxy uh, is now a 100 million euros company. And uh, we are very happy that we saw this and could invest. So um, for me, I think VC is the most exclusive club in the world. Yes. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, let's expand this club. And not for the sake of the poor founders, but for the society, because we are missing out on so much value and potential. You used the phrase an exclusive club, and I think also, you know, the C-suite and executive positions are also an exclusive club, right? And Lindsay, I know that the, this kind of C-suite female leadership is who you guys are working at Chief, but obviously there might be women who might not actually, who have that ambition, right? Yeah. But maybe they don't have the socioeconomic, they don't come from a socioeconomic background or a certain kind of background to make that open to them. How have you guys thought about Chief, about creating that network, but also making sure that that is accessible to Yeah, people? it's such a good question. When you look at closed networks, inevitably it becomes the question of power dynamics. Because if you're creating now a network, as we did at Chief, for women who are typically excluded, that now opens up a question around, well, if you were creating a network for women leaders, what about the women on the way up? So our mission at Chief is actually to change the face of leadership, to make sure that leadership as a whole is reflective of what society looks like. We started with executive women because my co-founder and I, as executive women, found that there were so many amazing organizations that focused on the pipeline that focused on uh, women in the workplace, women in business, um, mentorship of women, but we actually saw a market um, need for something that women who were in these executive level positions could join. And so our goal was never to exclude, it was to find this niche of women and saw a product market fit. And that product market fit was bigger than we ever expected. So Chief, we thought we'd have a few hundred women year one, we had thousands. As I mentioned, we're at 20,000 women across the US and UK. We became the fastest company led by women founders to hit a billion dollar valuation in history. And as we did that, we knew, okay, well, if we're focusing on women leaders, our goal in the future will be, how do we replicate this for women on the way up? How do we make sure that we are thinking through a future where we can build a community for women who are looking up to these women leaders? So uh, the first thing we want to do is make sure that we are being thoughtful around the entire ecosystem of women. The second thing that's really important for us is to know that when you look at women leaders, you are seeing within that small you know, construct of women you see that it is predominantly white women who are in these positions of power. And we, we were hyper aware of this day one. And so we wanted to make sure that diversity and inclusion were at the center of what we do. And you can't add that in later, right? I always say you can't make a cake and then smear the eggs on after it's baked, right? So we immediately looked at the numbers and saw that it was only 18% of women uh, who were in these VP through C-suite positions that were identified as women of color. So immediately set a goal, let's double that and make sure that our network has 36%. We monitor this every month. Right now we're at 34%. Not bad, but not at our goal. Um, and you can't just rest on, on, all right, we have an ambition, we'd like to hit those numbers. So what did we do? We outbound women to make sure that we are not just sitting in a closed network of word of mouth, because as you mentioned, people just invite their friends, right? Like that just ends up snowballing uh, white feminism, which isn't what we're looking to do. 
Um, and we've also democratized access to Chief. So we implemented a grant program. Uh, last year alone, we gave away $5 million of grants to make sure that access to Chief was as accessible as possible. And then when those women do join Chief, that's not enough. We want to make sure that there's identity groups that are thoughtful and private. So even within the space, there are places where communities can have their own conversations. Um, and I think it, it, for us, it's a journey. We know that building an exclusive network of executive women will leave out others. And so we are constantly learning, involving, listening to our members, and never thinking about members as customers. Members are stakeholders, and potential members, the public, women in business are our stakeholders. And when you are a mission-driven company, there are high expectations for you to always be listening, evolving. And so that's what we're committed to do as we ensure that we continue to grow, but never leave people out or feel like we are excluding people from our mission. I mean, all of these networks are amazing. You know, backing underrepresented founders, a place for women in business to find like-minded individuals, right? The Black Founders Fund, Black Angels Fund. But at the end of the day, in order to raise capital sometimes, you got to go in and you got to be in the rooms with those white men, right? Rachel, what do you think about that question, that tension between having a community for people like yourself, with a background like yourself, versus breaking into those rooms? Ugh. That's a tough one. So I, I will share a personal story, my personal journey. Um, so over the last year or so, I've been on a journey to expand my board portfolio, so getting new board roles. And if you look in this space, I got you know, my first one, and all of a sudden, topboarddirectors.com, all these different people reach out. It's like, what is topboarddirectors.com? Now, OK, I'm kind of in a club. OK, great. But there are so many other clubs, so many groups that want your money. $4,000, $1,000, all that. So I asked somebody um, that runs a nonprofit that focuses on boards, so what should I be a part of? What makes sense? Who's going to help me get to those board roles the fastest? She said, Rachel, <laughs> you can join those groups. It's great. And you will learn a ton. There will be lots of educational opportunities, all that. But at the end of the day, it is the white men that own those board roles. So you need to be networking with those white men. So when people ask me, you know, which way should I go? Should I join these clubs? Should I you know, try to get into the white man club? I say both. But I say you know, for the, the clubs specifically, you know, whether it's a black club or women's club, all, you need to be very clear on what you're going to get out of it. So if your goal is purely, I want a job, I want a job, I want a job, I want a role, I want this, I want that, and they don't have a way to deliver that, maybe not. If you want nurturing, which is very important in this journey, support, coaching someone to push you in the room with all those white men, then you, you might want to join those clubs. You need to know. And I think that's with anything in life when you're about to join it. I, last year, I was looking at board ready, or two years ago now, I was looking at board readiness programs. And everyone runs them, Harvard, Kellogg, Wharton, all of that in the US, right? But one of my big things was I wanted to make sure that, yeah, you're going to educate me, but you're also going to help me be in a place where I can be seen for proper roles. And so that's how I selected the one I went to for board readiness uh, education. I wanted one that would help place me. Um, I think there's a place for both. And I think, you know, when I look at the Black Founders Fund's recipients and the groups that we form there, I think there's, there's unfiltered support there. There's a place to go and say, oh my gosh, I have this problem. Like, what do I do? How do I address this? Or this investor said, this, is that weird? Like, other people with lived experiences. And when you go into these spaces where you are the only two, the only three, you know you have to expand, you know you have to beat down those doors to get into those other networks, but it is nice to have someone there, even if they're across the room and you see them, that you know has your back and can really, you know, Trust, you can trust them as you go through this journey together. Yeah. Suzanne, I wanted to come to you and talk a little bit about these questions in terms of funding for entrepreneurship, right? Obviously, you guys are building something amazing at Backing Minds, 
but you also have to convince LPs, right? And you also have to make sure that the people who are distributing capital reflect the kind of diverse founders that are out there. How have you thought about the questions of like who funds the funders, right? And then also getting more people like yourself to be in there writing those checks. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so uh, almost all capital goes to, like if you're raising capital in Europe or in the US, you should either be a white guy from the inner city or bring one. All the statistics tell you this. Uh, so uh, last year or this year, we just got a report. So 1% of venture capital uh, went to women. Um, we see on um, partnership level that we have 16% uh, partners being women now in VC. When I started, um, the numbers weren't so great, so it's a progress. But what matters is who is making the decision of the money. So if we look at assets under management, 91% of those are under men, like white guys. Um, so what does this mean? Um, yeah, it means that we are missing out on return, because this is a question about return. Uh, there are a lot of different statistics that show that diverse teams give you better return. We see that we lose 3 to 6% of GDP yearly, because we miss out on like, female founders. Uh, and this is not only about like, female founders, it's about uh, you know, different competencies, uh, backgrounds or age, a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So what we see now with LPs is that they see that we can get a great return <laughs> and we can also get great change. Mm -hmm. Why should we choose one of them? So actually, LPs are now putting demand on funds and founders. And uh, you mentioned uh, previously that, yeah, back in Mainz, you look at underrepresented founders. No, we look at all founders. Mm. And that's the difference. Um, and by doing so, you need to look outside of, you know, the recommendation from your friend's friend. <laughs> um, you need to look at the data. You need to look more outbound. <laughs> than inbound. So we, we're like, skip the deal flow. Of course, you should look at that as well, but start to do the more deal find. Mm. And uh, we have seen now that um, a lot of l other funds are now like, OK, guys, you, you showed us with back in minds. Um, so we are also putting targets on our funds. Like, yeah, we want for the next fund that it also should be like 25% female founders and so on. And what you measure is what you get. So that is the start. Mm. Um, and uh, what was your last question? <laughs> around uh, female GPs and around GPs from yeah, exactly. underrepresented because, backgrounds. Uh, like, if you only get 1% of venture capital, we see today that almost 30% of the founders are female, but they get 1% of the venture capital. Of course, you get less fuel to your company to be able to make an exit. And in order to be a GP for a fund, you also need cash. And that's how like, the structures in the VC industry are formed. Um, so that makes it harder for you <laughs> to come to that position. So we at Back in Minds, we have changed the structures for partnership. We are three uh, female GPs. Uh, together, we have uh, 10 kids. <laughs> Uh, and, of course, this is not a problem. And uh, in our fund, 90% of the founders are e either like, uh, like female or um, immigrant background, like myself, or from more rural areas uh, all over Europe. So, of course, it's, it's possible. And uh, it's about return in the end, as a survival for the industry, I would say. Yeah. I like how you kind of phrased at trying to change the profile of founders who get access to VC capital as a question not of looking for underrepresented 
founders specifically, but actually looking really at everything, yeah. right? Yes. And I think that brings um, me to the next question that I wanted to ask, which is about geography and the role of geography in networks, right? Does someone who lives in a hub that's not London or New York or San Francisco have the same access to those networks? How have you guys, whoever wants to jump in, feel free to jump in, thought about untangling that geographic question from networks? If you would. Lindsay, you want yeah, to? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there are obvious geographic market dynamics. I'm a New Yorker, right? I have New York goggles on, so my network is a lot easier because I can just rub shoulders and bump into people in a New York coffee shop. I go out of my way to make sure I can come to places like Slush and meet people that I wouldn't meet in New York City. And so I think globalization has helped us uh, ensure that founders have events like these where they can go. And it behooves people who are in these bigger markets like San Francisco, London, New York, to make an effort to get here and meet other founders, meet other VCs, uh, and, and make sure these conversations are more accessible. Obviously, the pandemic also pushed everybody to Zoom, and that allowed networking to blossom in a completely new way, and I think tore down some of the borders that uh, we, we faced through networking, where Zoom, I think, was less common. It's so easy now to hop on a Zoom. Right? It's just, it's expected, it's more typical. Um, but I think it is the onus of people who are in big geographic centers to get out of their comfort zone, take those meetings, and go to places like Slush. What about you, Suzanne? What yeah. about from like the sourcing point of view? How do you get out of there? How do you find all the founders? Uh, yeah, and we have to go out there. Um, the thing is that uh, you see that uh, 80 or 90% of the capital is in the capital cities. So in Finland, more than um, almost 90% of all capital goes to Helsinki. But you have uh, like 80% of the companies outside. Mm. So there you see like, okay, here is a gap, or you can call it an arbitrage, as we like to call it. Um, so we really like when we find the companies outside of these hubs because uh, um, it's easier, many times it's, you know, you don't get your CTO maybe like hijacked <laughs> <laughs> from, from someone else. Uh, you can build an organization, uh, you, um, uh, the most important thing is you should be close to your end user or your end customer. Mm. Where are they? So I had one of my best meetings was when I was, uh, uh, me and Sarah, we went to this very like rural place in in Sweden, and uh, we like met this founder who um, we were supposed to have a meeting, and then this founder just threw us out and said like, guys, I'm sorry, so many customers are calling, so I don't have time for this. <laughs> um, we were super interested, of course. Of course. Like after yeah. this. A new tactic. Yeah, exactly. Your founder. I'm too busy for you. They always yeah. want what they can <laughs> have. <Very> nice yeah. tactic. <laughs> I love that. Rachel, what about you? How do you think about geography? Uh, so when we, so I'll tell you, when we launched the fund year one, um, we were specifically looking for black founders. Yeah. And we knew from what we could see in the numbers, where I was actually like, well, what happened to France? <laughs> Because <laughs> that has like the most uh, biggest black population across Europe. So year two, we made an effort to really get out there, go visit these markets, let people know that this existed, do, do the viral kind of deep search for these black founders. Um, I think the other way around, I think originally when we talked, we were talking also our founders at a disadvantage being outside. Um, I'm not going to lie, they are. It's, it's a little bit of a harder uh, hurdle, right? You know, and there's structural things that are challenging for them, like there's taxation, proximity to your investors and consumers in some cases, uh, em employment laws if you start doing the remote work thing, all that. And then there are some funds, um, and I don't know the proper terms for this, you know, Suzanne will probably know this better than me, but some funds that are restricted in terms of where they can invest. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you know, sitting in Europe trying to get funding out of the US, it can be challenging if, for some investors to invest in you. So I'm, saying, I'm not saying it's easy, but I do think some of that can be mitigated as well mm -hmm. with extra effort from the founders. 
Totally, totally. Well, the fact that all three of you are sitting here today is also a testament to the networks that you've all built as individuals, right? And the power of networking, right? Which is like the action, I guess, of building a network, right? Um, so I'd love in the final few minutes that we have to ask each of you your, how do you network? How have you networked? And what do you think the best thing, way to network is? Suzanne, tell me. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, I think as a founder, before I was an investor, and I still identify as a founder, actually, um, I think you need to hustle to get into the real networks. That's the thing. You, you need to get into where the real power or what you want is. And for me, it was by uh, playing poker. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, I just uh, understood that a lot of um, like investors were playing poker. So I'm like, okay, I need to get into those games. And when you know, when you are at the finals table, and uh, you know, you've you know got some uh, capital from some of the investors, then they start to ask, ah, oh, you you said you had a startup. What was your company? Uh, and then the conversation starts. Um, so yeah, I have many of these examples. Um, Suzanne, that is an expensive way to yeah. network. <laughs> what? You must be good at poker. <laughs> um, I like to play poker. Lessons poker lessons after yeah. with Suzanne. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody, exactly. <laughs> Don't take Let's Suzanne play on play poker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she <No>. will win. <laughs> what about you, Rachel? No. What's, how, how do you approach networking? Um, so, I, I can say, you know, when my, my last role when I was at Google, my, my task in 2018 was to build the VC startup kind of partnership practice across this region. Problem was I didn't know any VCs here. So that was a big networking exercise. So I started off with very much like you, I need to be in the right place. I started off actually with Slush. And I asked Slush, you know, hey, can you make an intro to this VC, this VC, this VC? 2018, I lost my voice at Slush because I talked so much. Oh, yeah. um, I think the other way I approach it is I really look for kind of those allies that, so I use LinkedIn a lot actually. Who knows who? Who's my strongest connection? Can you make an intro? And then those, you know, we were talking about the different types of networks, the kind of exclusive ones versus the, I need something very direct one. The exclusive ones, you know, they, they nurture me and kind of give me that push in the back to walk in the room. And that's happened many times. And I've walked in and said, I can't do this. I'm the only black woman. And, you know, another woman has said, yes, you can. Boom, and pushed me in the room. So uh, that's how I approach it. It's a lot of uh, hustle, like you said and uh, just getting it done. Yeah, finding the place where the people you want to meet are and then yeah. going there. And slush, you know, 2018, every VC in the region goes here. So I was here too, in a little back room back there, taking meetings, thanks to slush in the intros. Oh my gosh, yeah. Lindsay, what about you? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I know we're in Finland, okay? But <laughs> I am very, very friendly and talkative. So much so, I think people have thought I've been weird the last couple days because I have approached a lot of strangers. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm a New Yorker. But it, I find that talking to people and broaching awkwardness is always the way in. Because most people that are here, everybody here, we all know one or two people, and yet we are all sitting together. We all want to meet each other. And somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to broach that awkward, who are you here with? Do you want to be friends? And so last night, we, we were at a bar last night, and, and I've, we just created a girl gang. I was like, are you by yourself? Are you by yourself? Come sit with us. And so I think if you have the confidence to just broach over that awkwardness, it's so easy to network, to talk to people, to find incredible minds that I think can be very reciprocal. Um, and I'm a big fan of building relationships, not necessarily thinking about networking as being transactional. Right. I am all about growing relationships and just meeting people, being friendly and knowing that, you know, five, ten years down the road, that relationship uh, may pay off for one of us, or it just may be a wonderful way to get through a very noisy conference full of strangers. I watched her in action yesterday. She's like, single woman there. 
we're going in. <laughs> we, we had a girl gang going. Yeah. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Are you going to recreate it tonight? Yeah. Everybody, come on. Get the women up here. You can be yeah. Everyone here has been invited to be invited part to. of the girl gang. <laughs> like, you know what, guys? You can come up also. We're playing poker. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my gosh. Poker. But Suzanne's definitely going to win. Suzanne's going to hustle everybody. No, oh my gosh. But I have to say, I also met my co-founder there. You met your co-founder only, poker? So not only. <laughs> can we play only with plastic I got chips? The, like, capital, but also my co-founder. So, no, but... Uh, Oh my yeah. gosh. This but, feels uh, like a dangerous poker game. Plastic chips. Plastic chips. Plastic yeah. chips. No money will be bet oh at tonight's poker day. game. Yeah. Well, thank you all. This was an incredible conversation. It was an honor to be up here on stage with all of you and everyone out there in the audience. Come network with these lovely panelists when they get we'll off stage. See you all backstage. <laughs> see you all backstage. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Nice. Done.